Okay, so uh, today we are going to discuss on the indoor air quality. Okay, uh, for information, uh, air quality, it uh, can be claimed as a uh, number three uh, for the uh, health burden, global health burdens. Okay, indoor air quality and also air quality. So it gives the uh, high impact to, uh, it gives the um, severe health impact to, to, to humans. Okay, so um, there are a lot of things that uh, give the challenge to provide or to have a, a good indoor air quality. Okay, so um, nowadays during the pandemic, most of people uh, spend their time in indoor air, in, in indoor environment. But I believe, uh, okay, according to literature review, 90% uh, most of people spend in the, uh, their time in indoor bar during the uh, COVID-19. I believe that more than 90% uh, people spend their time in indoor environment. Okay, so uh, due to the poor indoor air quality, more than 81% of people has a risk uh, to respiratory disease and dementities and 50% uh, more possible pollutants indoor than outdoor it is because uh, in indoor uh, it has a, a, a limitations of a dilutions uh, i mean uh, for the pollutants dilutions for the environments for the outdoor environment so you know uh, the chemicals can be diluted easily but in indoor it has a uh, restrictions yeah and then uh, six out of 10 homes or buildings are hazardous to their occupants' health due to the concentrated of the pollutants. And 58% uh, uh, people experience mold at homes. But in Malaysia, I believe that uh, more than 55% uh, or more than 60% uh, people experience to mold at home due to, uh, you know, uh, the climates of Malaysia uh, in terms of uh, humid and hot environment. And then 90% chemicals can be found in indoor environments. Um, okay, it probably becomes from the wall, from the uh, printing activities, from the furniture, and etc. Okay, so what is the factors that uh, influence the indoor air quality? Okay, so according to WHO, World Health Organizations, there are main four factors that uh, that contribute to uh, poor indoor air quality. First is the outdoor pollutants. Okay, number two is indoor sources from the activities, from the human activities, from the furniture, and then for the building uh, characteristics. Okay, nowadays due to the modern uh, modern era, okay, most of the buildings are designed uh, uh, with the air type uh, characteristic, which means that uh, very uh, you know. A uh, very less um, indoor and outdoor exchange rate. Okay, so these conditions can lead to poor indoor air quality. And then the last one is habits of building occupants, like um, people smoking. Okay, so that can be, um, I mean, a smoking in indoor environment. So it can be uh, factors for poor indoor air quality. Okay, so if you look at to the picture, it shows that the uh, the woman uh use the open fire for cooking yeah according to who the standard limits of exposure for um particulate matter pm10 is about 50 milligram per meter cubic but by uh, using the open fire uh for the cooking it can increase the pollutant uh the concentrations of pm10 up to 10,000 microgram per meter cubic okay so uh, the objective of the indoor air quality assessment or uh, indoor air quality sampling is uh, are to find the sources of the pollutants, what is the, you know, uh, where it comes uh, from the pollutants, the physical parameters. So we want to, we want to measure, we want to identify the, you know, the comfortness of the comfort of the building occupants in terms of, you know, in terms of uh, humidity, temperature, and that we want to check the compliance of the indoor air quality. Okay, so in Malaysia, we refer to 
uh, Industrial Code of Practice on IAQ for 2010. Okay, it is it was published by the Department of Occupational Safety and Health, uh, Malaysia. Okay, so um, another objective for indoor air quality monitoring is we can determine the level of our exposure of uh, building occupants to the pollutants then we can check whether the ventilations uh, are in a good uh, i mean uh, in a good conditions or well functioning so uh, we can determine by determining the the ventilation performance and then the last one by uh, determining the sources by determining the uh, level of air, uh, indoor air quality so we can propose the countermeasures for uh, providing a good indoor air quality okay so uh, indoor air quality assessment basically it can be qualitative it can also be a quantitative and olfactory analysis for the qualitative analysis it can be uh, you know uh, by the in the uh, deep interview with the building occupants yeah so by the quantity quantitative analysis uh, so we will discuss uh, now about the quantitative analysis uh, it means that we use instrumentations and then we analyze the data and then olfactory analysis olfactory analysis basically based on the order but you know uh, less less uh, people use this method for uh, analyzing the level uh, of uh, indoor air quality. Okay, so again, in Malaysia, we refer to these main uh, guidelines uh, to this uh, code of practice, which is Industrial Code of uh, Practice uh, on, sorry, uh, this is a typo, uh, Industrial Code of Practice on uh, Indoor Air Quality uh, 2010, okay? Uh, as for example, in the US, uh, they use the building assessment survey and evaluation study. Okay, so both of these are the standard guidelines for assessing the indoor air quality. Okay, so here there are a list of the skills which are required by the indoor air quality assessor to conduct indoor air quality sampling. Okay, first we uh, we need the basic knowledge on uh, MVAC system, which means uh, mechanical ventilations, air conditioning system, operating principle. Okay, it's like uh, where is the return? Where is the supply of the ventilation system? Okay, where is the um, the filtration system of that uh, MVAC system? And then to uh, ability to read the architectural and mechanical plans and understand manufacturer's catalog data on equipment. Okay, architectural and mechanical plans. Uh, if let's say you get the task for uh, assessing the indoor air quality, so you have to know the layout designs of the building. Okay, because it is very important for you to determine what, uh, how many, the number, how many uh, sampling points. Okay, where should you uh, look at your instrumentations? Okay, so in fact, you have to know the mechanical plans because it highly relates to the ventilation system. Okay, how many numbers of the inlet, how many numbers of the outlets of the uh, ventilation system? And then ability to identify items of your office equipment. Okay, as I mentioned before, office equipment like uh, photocopying machines, video, uh, printer, it can be the sources of the pollutants. Yeah, ability to work cooperatively with building occupants and gather information about space usage. Okay, so uh, again, if you get the, the, the task for monitor the indoor air quality, so of course, First, you have to get the permissions from the building owner. So you have to get the, uh, the information about the building. So you have to uh, work, uh, work together with the building, uh, building, building owners. Yeah? And then ability to collect information about the ventilation system, of operations, equipment, and maintenance schedules. Okay, so here you need the um this this kind of the the informations because you know you can uh based on the maintenance so you can determine the effectiveness or the level of ventilation system uh as for example 
in the uh, for the MPEG system, it has the filter. So uh, filter, I mean, uh, this filter uh, can uh, it uh, it filter out the pollutants from the uh, from the indoor environment. Okay, so by by knowing the maintenance, so you can determine is that the filters are in a good conditions. How many how many uh, how many times the filter has been changed? Okay. And then authority to collect information from subcontractors about work schedules and material use. Okay, uh, as for example, for the cleaning activities, uh, you have to remember that the um, for the cleaning activities, it can be the sources for the pollutants like the uh, cleaning agents. Um, yeah. In the cleaning agents, it consists of the many kinds of the chemicals like. Uh, for multi-height, uh, volatile organic compound. So by, by collecting this information, so you can predict where is the success of the uh, pollutants in the indoor, um, indoor environment. And then ability to understand the information contained in SDS. Okay, safety data sheets. Okay, so if let's say, uh, again, uh, refer to the uh, cleaning agents. So you, uh, if you get the the activities of the cleaning activities, so you can ask to the uh, to the building owner or to to the building technical to provide you the uh, SDS. I mean SDS for the cleaning agents. So you, based on that, based on the SDS, you can predict the health symptoms of the uh, building occupants. Then uh, the needs of indoor air quality assessments or samplings. So when we have to conduct the indoor air quality assessment, first when we uh, receive the complaints from the building occupants, the occupancy in the space exceeds the recommended numbers of occupancy in the original designs. Okay, so how can you get the, the recommended number? of the occupancy in the original design. Okay, so um, basically in the first uh, layout design, I mean the original layout design, it can be stated, it can be stated the numbers of the people can be occupied in the in the in the specific room. If you do not have that uh, that data, you can refer to UBBL. Okay, uh, UBBL is a uniform building uh, law. Okay, that is a law for Malaysia. Okay, um, law in Malaysia regarding to the uh, building. So, uh, based on the specific area, so you can determine by referring to the uh, UBBL, so you can determine what is the optimum number of the building occupants for each space. Yeah, and then renovations. Renovations are made that involve significant changes to the ventilation system. Okay, uh, for information, most uh, the ventilations. The poor ventilation system it can be the main uh, issues for poor indoor air quality. So if we change, uh, I mean, if the renovation occurs and it changes the ventilation system, so we need to re uh, we need to conduct indoor air quality assessments. Okay, so there are main uh, three steps uh, for uh, indoor air quality samplings or assessment. First is uh, walkthrough inspections. So uh, walkthrough inspections. Um, during the walkthrough inspections, we can uh, we can get the data uh, like uh, building characteristics, the number of uh, number of the occup building occupants, and then uh, questionnaires. Okay, the functions of questionnaire is I mean uh, you distribute the questionnaires to building occupants. So by using the building, uh, the questionnaires, you can determine the health symptoms. Is there any health symptoms uh, among, among the building occupants which related to the poor indoor air quality? Okay, so number two is assessment or sampling. So here uh, you, need to you need to use the instrumentations. And then the last one, after you get the data, you have to analyze the data. How about the compliance? If not, if uh, in compliance, so you have to propose the uh, control measures. And then the last one is a reporting. Okay, 
yeah, for the walkthrough inspections, for the checklist, you can get the information like a uh, number of occupants, ventilation system, pollution pathway, and potential sources of the contaminants. Okay, so during the walk through observation so you have to run uh you, you have to walk uh in the buildings you have to check uh, the ventilation system you have to uh, in a practice you have to get a picture get a photo of the possible potentials of uh of the pollutants yeah and then the questionnaires for buildings uh, occupants, it includes the demographic of the people of the building occupants, indoor environmental conditions, uh, like um, is there any dusty environment, uh, drought, uh, uneven temperature, uh, and then the past, present diseases or symptoms like uh, nausea, cough, uh, di uh, dizziness, um, headache. Okay, so for the sampling strategy, before you, you, you start the sampling, you have to uh, have the uh, sampling strategy. Uh, the purpose of the sampling strategy is to eliminate or reduce the sampling errors. Okay, so there are three types of the sampling strategy for indoor air quality. Uh, first is interday between day, uh, number two is error in the instrumentations, and number three is a systemic changes. Okay, for the inter-day, uh, I mean the between day, possibility the environmental condition will be fluctuated. So it, ha it will, when the environmental condition fluctuates, so of course it will uh, give the impact to the concentrations of the pollutants. And then number two is the equipment or instrumentations. It's like you, uh, it's like uh, improper calibration, improper use of equipment, error in recording of the data. Okay, so please bear in your mind, uh, you have to use the calibrated instrumentations for conducting the uh, indoor air quality uh, monitoring. And then the systematic changes due to the uh, building uh, activities. I mean, uh, not building activities, due to the activities of the building occupants, yeah? And then what to sample? Okay, so if you refer to Industrial Code of Practice on IQ 2010, the, these are basically uh, the parameters uh, need to be sampled, okay? For the physical, uh, like a relative humidity, temperature, air movement. Uh, number two is a ventilation indicator performance. So we need to measure the concentrations of carbon dioxide. And then for the chemicals, we measure the CO, total volatile organic compounds, ozones, formaldehyde, and the respir respirable particulates. And then for the biologicals, it includes uh, the fungi and the bacteria. Uh, if you look at to the US standards, uh, there are one another one uh, another uh, parameters which means um, radiant, but in Malaysia we did not measure the radiant. Um, <clears throat> okay, so where to sample? Uh, so these are basically the sampling uh, guidelines for, uh, uh, I mean the sampling positions. First, uh, the sampling position position should represent the primary workstation layout and work activities okay uh, as for example in the office you have to you know you you have to uh, look at your instrumentation at the center of the office you can you know you can uh, look at your instrumentation in the pantry because uh, it cannot represent the actual activities of the uh, office and then um, the positions of the, the instrumentation should be of minimal disturbance of work activities within the area, uh, the study area. Okay, here uh, I would like to give a recommendation that you cannot, you are, you know, you cannot uh, locate your instrumentations uh, at the uh, at the laluan, okay, the tengah tengah laluan uh, of the office. Okay, so because you know it can give the 
disturbance uh, to your data, you know, like the when the people movements, so it will create the uh, air uh, air movement changes the air velocity. So it with these conditions, these activities will give the impact to the physical parameters. I mean, for air uh, air movement, at least zero point five from the corners or windows walls, partitions, and other vertical surfaces. Okay, so uh, for the windows and walls, okay, uh, some buildings, uh, they use the uh, glass for the walls, as, as a walls. Okay, so uh, if you remember, okay, so for, for the physical parameters, we need to measure the temperature. So what happened? if we locate the instrumentation is just near to the wall uh, i mean wall uh, construct by the uh, by the glass so of course you uh, uh, you know you will get not uh, accurate data inaccurate data in terms of the temperature uh, in fact uh, um, you also cannot uh, okay for the walls okay please remember that the Buildings walls like, uh, yeah, building walls. It can produce. It can release the particulate matter, uh, and then the paint uh, on the surface of walls. It will release the uh, volatile organic compounds. So you, so you cannot uh, look at your uh, your instrumentations very close to the walls and the windows not directly in front of the air supply diffuser, induction unit for floor fans or heaters or the, uh, or the exhale breath of the operator. Okay, so again, um, if you look at to the physical characteristics, uh, temperature and air movement, if you locate, uh, you locate the, uh, your instrumentations, I mean instrumentation for sampling, near to or in front of the air supply diffuser, it will give, uh, you know, um, imbalance. I mean, the fluctuations of the data for the, uh, for the uh, air movement, I mean, air velocity, not under direct sunlight that will impact to the instrumentations, preferably not in hallways or passageways, Okay, so this uh, another uh, another uh, explanation for this is for the safety purposes. If you locate the uh, instrumentations at the hallway, so it will you know it will disturb or you will provide another hazards to the uh, building occupants. Probably orang akan telangga that the instrumentations at least one meter from localized houses such as photocopier machines from the printers and that not within three meters of an elevator if a sample at a corridor uh, or a lobby again it's also reflect to the safety purpose not within two meters of the doors okay so uh, the doors um, for information door windows or the crack it can provide the natural ventilation to indoor environments you know uh, door and uh, door or windows or cracks uh, the pollutants can infiltrate from the outdoor into the indoor environments to the nat natural ventilation system i mean from the door from the window opening window from the crack or from the holes of the walls not obstructive uh, <clears throat> not obstructive or to interfering with the acumen egress from the study area under normal or emergency situations, not at the junctions connected to the stations of the public, public transport facilities, placing inlet of sampler at a height between 75 uh, cm and 120 cm. Uh, preferably 110 centimeter from the floor. Okay, 75 to 120 centimeters. It represents the 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 situations on. I mean the the height of uh, people sitting. 
So uh, it also can represent uh, near to the breeding zones of uh, human. Okay, so uh, how can you determine the sampling point? How many numbers of the sampling point? Okay, so if uh, you can get this data from the industrial code of practice on IQ 2010, okay, as for example, total for area, uh, like uh, more than 3000 meters square. So the minimum numbers of sampling point should be one per uh, 500 meters square. Yeah, so factors to be considered uh, for determining the sampling point, area size, Okay, so you can look at here, uh, workstations and design, rooms, is there any rooms, Parti uh, is there any partitions or pantry in the office, and back zones, uh, number of occupants, and then depending on the types and nature of the buildings, what of the activities conducted in the buildings. Okay, for the sampling donations, uh, there are two types of the sampling durations, surrogate measurement, or, or uh, and then uh, number two is a long-term or uh, in our sampling, which use the uh, integrated sampling. Okay, so for the surrogate measurements, we can use the uh, intermittent uh, measurements, or I mean, uh, by using the instrumentations. Uh, so how can you plan your sampling durations like um, first measurement based on average of half an hour at four time slots, which means for each slot, you have one reading and then you get the reading for every five minutes. And then for the office, uh, time slot should be evenly distributed over the business hours. Okay, so for the office, if, we, if Okay, let's say you apply for four time slots from the eight hours to five hours. Uh, no, uh, eight hours. Start from the eight, um, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So you can uh, divide two slots in the morning and then two slots in the afternoon. Okay, let's say uh, first slot in the morning, start, uh, start from the uh, 8 a.m. until to 10 a.m. That is one slot. And then uh 11 to 1 uh 11 uh 11 a.m to 1 p.m that is another one slot and then uh, uh in the afternoon uh two to three or and then three to five uh p.m so that is a uh that are uh another two slots so for each slots you can get you can take the measurements uh within five minutes then after uh, after you get um, if let's see uh, in the morning uh, at uh, eight a.m. you get the data for, you get the reading for five minutes and then uh, <clears throat> uh, during uh, at the eleven p.m. you get another five minutes readings and then uh, during uh, at the two p.m. you get another readings three p.m. Uh, four or three p.m. you get another reading so here you have a for data which represents for the four slots of uh, samplings. And then for the public space, uh, it is it's highly recommended to uh, sample, to get uh, to do the sampling at the time, which, I mean, uh, for the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario here, is it reflects to the highest numbers of the visitors or highest numbers of the occupancy, like, uh, you know, in this uh, public space, like a shopping mall. So um, the, the highest numbers of the occupancy probably in, during the lunch hour and then during the dinner. So during these kinds of periods, you, you can conduct the sampling. And then for the Okay, so surrogate measurements is like, you know, you use a method for the grab sampling. Okay, you, I mean, you do not uh, allocate a long period for the sampling. You divide uh, the slots for uh, sampling. But another method uh, is a long term uh, sampling. <clears throat> uh, so uh, basically, this can be represented for a single value data. So you can 
uh, represent the actual uh, environment. So based on that, you can you know you can determine which time, what time that data uh, the or the pollutants shows the increments or show the decrements. So based on that. I mean, uh, so based on the uh, full period of the sampling, so you can see the trend of the uh, of the pollutions in indoor environment. Okay, so for the biological sampling, uh, you can base, uh, you can apply the NIOSH manual analytical method. Uh, the number is 0800. Okay, so for the uh, for the clean office. So the sampling duration is recommended for up to uh, 10 minutes. Average room with minimal visible dirt. So it probably uh, you can uh, do a sampling up to five minutes. And then the poor environment with the visible contaminated area. So you can do the sampling uh, for uh, bioaerosols up to two minutes. And then, okay. So here I will go uh, each parameters, the measurement, the instrumentation used for uh, each parameters. Okay, so now uh, this is a, for a physical uh, parameters, which are temperature, relative humidity, and the air movement. Okay, for the temperature, we can use web bulb globe temperature. Okay, so this is uh, specific, specifically you, uh, that can use for uh, determining the temperature and relative humidity. And then for the air movement, we can use uh, this instrumentation, which called as an anemometer. Or here, if you look at to the right side, the right picture, uh, so this instrumentation we call it, uh, we call as a uh, capture hood valometer. Okay, so these instrumentations we can use to determine the uh, air movement or air velocity. Uh, it should uh, it should set up the monitor at the shoulder level of a seated person. Okay, so if you use the uh, anemometer, so you have to you know you have to set uh, the locations or the probe. Uh, at the uh, shoulder levels of the seated person, uh, which means uh, 75 centimeter to 120 centimeter, or measured at the supply air at the height of the seated person. And then for the chemical parameters, okay, um, <clears throat> CO and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Okay, so if you look at here, the ventilation indicator performance we measure in terms of carbon monoxide. It not listed in the uh, chemical parameters, but the method, uh, I mean, the instrumentations for determining the concentrations of CO2 is the same. Yeah, we can use the uh, NDIR analyzer or, uh, I mean, uh, electrochemical oxidation uh, device. And then for the former dehyde, there are three types of the sampling uh, procedures. First, we can use a sam active sampling and, and uh, active samplings like here. Okay, so this is a impinger. So active samplings means that we use the energy or we use this, uh, the pump to, to collect the sample, to collect the, the indoor air. Yeah, so this is an uh, example like uh, uh, impinger. So this is the uh, for the active sampling. And then for the sam uh, passive sampling, uh, we can use the desorptions of hydrozines and analyzed by the HPLC. And then we can also use a direct reading instrumentations. Okay, like this. This is the formal D meter. And then for the ozones, Okay, so for the ozones, uh, okay, if you look at here, these are uh, examples uh, for the ozone meters. So uh, we can measure by using the real time instrumentations, by using the concepts of metal oxide semiconductors, electrochemicals, UV uh, photometrics, and the chemiluminescence detectors. 
And then for the for, for respirable dust, okay, we for the direct readings, we can use a uh, detector which use the probe, I mean uh, optical scattering or piezoelectric monitors like this. Okay, these uh here these instruments we call it as a dust mate. Or if you use the integrated sampling uh, sampling method, we can refer to the NIOSH method 060600. Okay, so this method, we use a filter, we use a concepts of a gravimetric analysis. Uh, we use a filter and then you, we use a filter and then sampling pump. And then we do a monitoring after sampling, we uh, we reweight the weight of the uh, filter. Okay, for the TVOC, total volatile organic compounds, there are two methods for uh, analyzing or for collecting the TVOC. First, uh, by using the uh, method uh, long term or integrated sampling for eight hours. Okay, the antiquated method with the whole air sampling by precipitated canister or solid solvent and followed by the uh, direct flame ionization detections based on this method. Okay, so here I would like to show you uh, the solvent tube. Okay, we can also use the solvent tube uh, to, the, uh, to measure the uh, TVOC. So this is a handheld uh, air sampling pump. Uh, so you attach the solvent tube here, and then uh, after sampling, you can get the changes of the uh, color of the solvent tube. Uh, I mean, uh, the colorimetric uh, method. And then based on the scale, you can measure, you can determine the concentrations of the uh, TVOC. And then for the real-time monitoring, you can use the PID or FID, a flame, a flame ionization detectors. And then uh, for calibrating the uh, PID or FID, we can use the isobutylene as the references uh, calibrations cast. And then uh, for the biological contaminations, contaminants, so uh, this instrument, we call it as a biostage uh, impactor, okay, two stage uh, cascade impactor impingers. Okay, so when we use these instrumentations, we need to refer to NIOSH method 08000. Okay, so this method is specifically for bioaerosols in indoor environment. So another method, we can use a reuter centrifugal samplers and a surface air systems bioaerosols. Uh, field guide for the for the for the determinations of biological contaminants in uh, environmental samples. Okay, so this method proposed by the IHOP, uh, American Industrial Hygienist Associations, and then uh, okay, so this is a uh, procedures for uh, sampling and analysis of bioaerosols. Uh, of course, uh, at first you have to uh, to prepare a uh, agar plates, okay, and then at the sites you collect uh, the bio as a sample by using the impactors and the uh, and the uh, agar plates like this, yeah, and then after that you need to incubate uh, agar plates, uh, the samples, and then uh, the last one you can count the colony uh, of the. Uh, uh, fungi or bacteria. Okay, uh, the last one is um, reporting. Um, so uh, there are there are a few steps you have to consider during reporting. First, you have to uh, uh, to describe uh, the assessment and sampling method. Of course, at first you have to identify. Uh, you have to explain. Uh, the objective of the sampling. So you have to describe the building uh, itself. I mean, where is the locations of the buildings? What is the activities of the buildings? I mean, the, is that the business buildings or the domestic buildings? And then uh, you have to, to 
to provide the layout designs of the uh, of the buildings. Okay, so number two, you have to discuss the identifications of potential sources of indoor air problems. Okay, so here, uh, if you remember, we can identify the building, uh, I mean, the potential sources of indoor air, uh, indoor air pollutants uh, via the walkthrough observations and the uh, building occupants questionnaires. Okay, uh, let's see uh, from the uh, walkthrough observations from the from the from the observations, so you can uh, provide the photo of the sources of the pollutants. Like if okay, if you identify or you you can find any uh, any mold or sp uh, spores on the wall of the buildings, so you can provide that photo as a as an evidence for the uh, for the potential sources of indoor air problems. And then the measurements results of for the contaminant for the contaminants. Uh, so before you provide the results, you have to uh, elaborate your method, which method that you use, uh, which instruments that you use for sampling, and then after uh, methodology, so you can discuss your uh, data by uh, your data. I mean, so here you can re uh, relate with the sources of the pollutants, with the building characteristics, uh, from the uh, building occupants activities, uh, from the sources. So you can relate your data with the uh, with the measurement data and the, the sources. And then you have to uh, compare your data with the uh, parameters which listed under uh, industry code of practice on IAQ 2010. So based on that, you can determine the level of uh, indoor air quality. Is that good or is that a poor uh, conditions of indoor environment? And then uh, the conditions of the ventilation system, which including the numbers of air changes per hour and the rate of fresh air changes. Okay. Uh, in uh, Industrial Code of Practice, it just stated that we have to, uh, that we need to measure the air movement. But uh, if you want to produce a very informative uh, report for IQ, you can add the information on the uh, air exchange per hour. Air exchange per hour, uh, it means that the how many numbers of the uh, air indoor and outdoor, I mean the changes, the rate of changes uh, of air between uh, indoor and outdoor. I mean, uh, okay, for example, in uh, for the build uh, for the office uh, office uh, building, okay, uh, it is recommended for two liters per hour for air changes. Okay, so where can you get the data or uh, or the informations for the air uh, change per hours? You can get from the actual standards for the ventilations of uh, buildings. So I forget the exactly title for that for that um, uh, guidelines, but you can get from from uh, from that standards. Yeah, and then. Um, for the air change per hours, uh, you cannot simply measure by uh, determining the air change uh, by determining the air movement in indoor environment. So there are a lot. Uh, so there are calculations that you have to use to determine the uh, air change per hours. Yeah, and then the rate of fresh air changes. Um, uh, in my experience, uh, uh, I had deal, uh, I have been dealing with many uh, projects uh, for indoor air quality. Yeah, uh, the main problems for indoor air quality is actually in Malaysia. Uh, is actually comes from the relative humidity. 
ya yeah. uh, especially uh, the the buildings uh, which located near to the sea which located to near to the uh, river or the or the lake so uh, these buildings will you know will have a problem with the fungi uh, and the uh, uh, bacteria at the wall of the buildings yeah uh, in fact now i'm uh, one of the uh, uh, iq expert persons in ump to solve the problems uh, in indoor air quality in fact in uc malaysia pahang uh, it also has a uh, indoor air quality problems especially uh, for the buildings which are located at the pekang Pekan Pahang. Okay, uh, for information, uh, UMP, we have uh, two campus. Okay, Pekan and Gambang. Uh, Pekan Pahang, it's, uh, uh, the locations of uh, UMP Pekan is very near to the uh, sea. So, uh, it is believed that the problems of indoor air quality is due to the, you know, sea breeze, due to the very close to the uh, to to the sea so uh, uh, the relative humidity in indoor buildings especially in uh, ump pekan uh, has a high relative humidity has a you know a lot of fungi fungi actually so now uh, i'm uh, actively uh, try to solve uh, me and my team okay actively involved with the project to solve the indoor air quality problems in UMP Gam, uh, in UMP Pekan. And then uh, has complaints. So um, you you need to uh, identify, you need to to explain uh, the symptoms, uh, I mean the has symptoms because you know um, it is actually uh, you you can relate is there um, conditions? I mean, in, uh, indoor air quality condition will give the impact to the health, uh, health, uh, health conditions of the building occupants. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Hidayah, for the very comprehensive and insightful talk on uh, indoor air sampling. Uh, we actually like at the end of the lecture. However, I think we do have a few minutes for any possible uh, question coming from the students. So perhaps we can have two for the first for 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 uh, for, the, for the beginning. Anybody have any question regarding Dr. Hidayah's talk on indoor air sampling? Switch on your mic and uh, you can ask straight away. Okay, so I think probably they're too shy to ask, but perhaps I can ask one question if you allow to, Dr. Hidayah. Uh, Dr. Yao, sorry, I forgot to turn on the camera. Uh, oh, it's okay. Um, <laughs> It's okay. Anyway, uh, uh, this this lecture is solely uh, focused on the uh, the the lecture slide that you have presented. Uh, well, what I like about your presentation is that it comes along with all those uh, uh, methods. So you quote the the method number and also the methods that has been used in the in the industry for uh, collecting air samples and uh, by referring to different kind of uh, analytes that you want to collect. Uh, I think probably your, your lecture is too comprehensive and too detailed that the students actually don't have room to, uh, to, to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Yang, uh, actually in uh, UMP, uh, I allocate uh, more than five hours only for the topics of indoor quality. Yeah. That is very detailed. <laughs> Anyway, um, I think since there are no questions coming from the student side, I would like to ask you one very simple question regarding uh, this, uh, this topic. Um, what would you think of the uh, greatest challenge in, uh, in training students handling equipments in uh, 
indoor air quality? Is there, do you face any challenges when you're training them? Was it because of their logistical problem that you need to like train, train them hands on? Um, can you share a little bit of your uh, experience in training UMP students? Okay, um, basically for UMP students, we have a, uh, two subjects related to industrial hygiene. For, uh, one is industrial hygiene, so that is a more uh, on the basics, on the fundamentals, on the industrial hygiene. And then another one is exposure measurement technique and analysis. Okay, so for this subject, uh, all students need to use the instrumentations. So they need to show their ability to to handle the equipment, okay? Uh, in a practice, yeah, uh, I will give uh, the, uh, the students a topics re related to industrial hygiene, like um, indoor air quality, like uh, chemical monitoring, noise monitoring. So the, all the students need to go to the industries or need to find the venue to do the monitoring. So, you know, before that, um uh in the class i will show them how to use the instrumentations and then uh theory and uh, practical knowledge and then before uh they go to the sampling in industry they have to uh i mean they have to train retrain again uh, retrain uh the skills i mean the uh, the science officer will teach them again how to how to use the instrumentations. So they will, uh, the task is a group assignment, group, uh, group, yeah, group assignment. So, you know, in industry, they will share uh, the knowledge, the skills, not only, uh, I mean, not the individual task. So when they go to the industries, so, you know, they can practice their knowledge uh their knowledge uh what they get from the industry uh, i mean industry they can you know they can uh do the monitoring so they will get the real real situations in industry uh, so for the buildings so indoor air quality so they can get a real i mean real problems in, uh, of the indoor air quality so after that when they uh for the presentations i will train them I will give the answer uh, to them, like, you know, uh, uh, for, I, I don't know. Do you know what, uh, uh, in Malaysia, we have an uh, indoor air quality uh, competency? Dr. Yon, do you know about that? I have no idea. Perhaps that is under the, the expertise of uh, Dr. Ismaniza. So yeah. she, hopefully, she will going to cover the same topic that you mentioned just now on the same student. Uh. <laughs> Okay, so, um, you know, in the DOSH, there are a lot of uh, competencies like a uh, noise risk assessment, a risk assessor, chemical assessor, indoor air quality assessor. So when uh, students back to university, so they have to re present their findings. So we will train them as, you know, as a competent, uh, <clears throat> as assessor. Yeah, so that is a practice in... Um, in the uh, units in Malaysia Pahang. But the challenge is um, sometimes, you know, the instrumentation is very sensitive. Sometimes when uh, students salah tekan tekan instrumentation, so, you know, uh, the data we lost. So, bila balik ke university, data yang diorang, uh, mereka dah sampling, so, you know, uh, they are now record in the data logging. So in my uh, my suggestions to students uh, during sampling, you cannot only rely on the depends on the uh, on the uh, instrumentation. I mean on the data logging. So you have to record by yourself. In case in the worst case scenario, if the data loss, so you can get you uh, the students will have a, a backup. I mean the written uh, the backup data by handwritten. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hidayah. I guess uh, from your answer just now, that reflects how relevant this topic is in, uh, in the student's uh, potential career. It seems like whoever that is going to come up from this uh, course, environment technology course, 
will be most likely going to involve in this indoor air monitoring very likely not necessary but very very likely mm -hmm. so students listen carefully take this seriously in this topic uh and 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 i remember just now you mentioned about noise as well and for your information uh we have a, a subject in noise specifically which will be taught later in this uh by, by uh, which will be taught later to the students later in their semester perhaps i think in the future semesters i think so i think uh whatever they have given so far has uh, alerted them and given some uh insights on what is about to happen to them next time so this will be the the, the warning the warning sign to them so that they can take they have to take this topic seriously here yeah? okay um by the way dr Hidayah, it seems like the time is almost up so i guess um the students still have no questions, so I think we can end here our session. So before we go, I would like to thank once again to uh, Dr. Nor Hidayah Abdul for willing to take up uh, this invitation to teach our students here in uh, UITM Mara, uh, UITM Shah Alam. So we wish to have you again, if for other subjects, given of your, I mean, insightful lecture earlier. So thank you once again. We wish to see you in the future. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you, right. Dr. John. Thank you, the other students. Okay. Bye. See you bye. later. Yeah.